Britain is sending Challenger 2 tanks to Ukraine and Poland plans to send a company of its German-made Leopard 2 tanks. Berlin is now under severe political pressure to follow suit and send its own Leopard 2s amid severe criticism that it is failing to help Kyiv fight back against Russian forces. So, if those tanks arrive, can they change the face of the conflict in Ukraine? And why is Germany so reticent? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Philip Hampshire. Britain's Prime Minister says sending Challenger tanks and additional artillery to Ukraine will help push Russian troops back. But along with the Leopards from Poland, that is still just a handful of tanks confirmed for Ukraine. Sources say this is just a gesture to persuade other European countries to send tanks and weapons as well. The Leopards and Challengers are reputed to be superior to Russia's in-service tanks. So. Could they help bring the conflict to an end or cause an escalation? And is that what Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz is worried about? So let's meet our guests from the US state of North Carolina. We have Professor Klaus Larres. He's a distinguished professor of history and international affairs at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Meanwhile, in Poland's capital, Warsaw, we have Wojciech Szybliski, who is editor-in-chief of Visegrad Insight. That's an analysis and media group. And in Portsmouth in southern England, we have Professor Peter Roberts, who's a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute think tank. So if we can start off um, with uh, Wojciech, first thing that I've got to ask you is um, 12 tanks being sent by the UK to Ukraine. Is this simply a gesture? 12 tanks doesn't sound like a lot. Well, but it's still uh, something that uh, this war effort has been built on. Uh, initial breakthrough with um, political uh, movements that that generated further uh, opportunities to, to for other countries to join in. There is a there is strong backing and efforts from Poland. Also, there are talks with other Central European and generally European countries to be on board to to deliver some of the tanks. So that Ukraine altogether is is crowdsourced by um, by the equipment it requires to defend itself and to withstand what is apparently upcoming a, a new Russian offensive. Professor Laris, um, if I can put the same question to you, uh, if I may, Klaus, Challenger tanks. First of all, the Ukrainians aren't, aren't, aren't trained in how to use Challenger tanks. They're not used to using them. So 12 tanks is going to take a lot of training. Is it worth the effort for such a small number? Well, absolutely. It's a beginning. And the British have made clear that they want to put pressure on other governments, particularly the German government, to do the same and uh, deliver, in the German case, the Leopard 2 uh, tanks. And of course, the Germans don't just need to deliver them themselves. And they have a very limited stock uh, available in Germany, which is actually functioning and is not under repair. But the Germans need to give permission to other countries, such as Poland and Finland, to deliver their Leopard uh, 2 uh, tanks to Ukraine. Because these tanks were manufactured in Germany. If they need to be re-exported, they have to be, be given uh, permission from the Germans. So the Challenger tank uh, is the uh, beginning. And I think everyone now will think very hard about providing these massive battle tanks to Ukraine. Right, we're going to talk about the Leopard 2 tank in just a second and the distinction here between Challenger's Leopard 2's Abraham tanks from the United States, because which tanks and when is almost as important as what's being done right now. But we'll get back to that. Uh, Professor Peter Roberts, if I can put it across to you, are you in agreement with the other two guests? Is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? The important point is the modern battlefield, particularly in Ukraine, is, is built on the use of armour, which is spearheaded by tanks. Now, you can't use tanks alone, so they're really important, but they need to be surrounded by a layer of infantry, of artillery, of support. So tanks are critical for the coming offensives, both for Russia and 
for Ukraine, um, providing them both is really important. But the surrounding capabilities that go with them is also really important. Otherwise, you could end up with, with the scenes exactly like you have with the Russians, where tanks are simply destroyed. So this is a really important moment and hopefully will stimulate the release of uh, political permissions to allow tanks to be transported from others, particularly the Leopards 2, the red card of which is held by Germany, to get to Ukraine in time for them to be fighting. There are huge logistics problems with using lots of different platforms, but the reality is the Ukrainians have proved themselves really capable of adapting to different types of equipment. And I think that's the important point here. 12 won't make a huge difference across a massive front line of two and a half thousand miles, but it will make a difference politically, symbolically, but as well as tactically on the front line in very small areas. OK, tactically, I'm going to focus on the tactical side of this. I'm looking forward to all three of you pulling funny faces at me as I put this one out there. But here we go anyway. When this, war, uh, when this conflict in Ukraine first started, uh, the Russians charged over the border with a large number of tanks. Obviously, we know what happened. They were rebuffed, and they were rebuffed because of the new anti-tank weapons that had been coming out of the West. There were a large number of armchair generals in the following weeks to that saying the tank is dead. It is no longer relevant on a modern battlefield. So, Peter, straight back across to you. Is that true or not? Well, I think patently it's not true. The Ukrainians have been asking for tanks since the start of this. And, and yet the Western perceptions of what war would look like are remarkably different from what it's turned out like. Back in 2021, they had the UK then Prime Minister, not so many uh, long ago, Boris Johnson, who was giving evidence to his own MPs saying, we no longer need tanks, they're a sunset capability, they're out of date. Tomorrow's war will be about cyber, it'll be about space, it'll be about all sorts of smart AI and machine learning and autonomous drones. But the reality is combat is about death and destruction, it's about heavy armour and killing people and difficult to operate platforms. And this is where the tank really comes into its own. It is a hardened, protected piece of firepower that really remains unsurpassed on the battlefield, provided that it operates within a, a battle group of capabilities, a, a whole uh, a swathe of other escorting uh, facets that are needed on a modern battlefield. Right, Wojciech and Klaus, I'm assuming both of you are going to agree with that, so I'm not going to pass that across to you. I'm going to move on and talk about the Leopard 2 tank for a second, if I may. So uh, for the viewers at home, just so everyone's on the same page, um, the Leopard 2 main battle tank is reputed to be among the best battle tanks in the world. It's to NATO's most successful and widely exported tank to armies in 18 different countries. Uh, it's heavily armoured. It's the German heavyweight. It first entered service, though, in 1979. This is a 40-year year plus old piece of technology. There are those still around 3,000 that have been exported or built under license. And following various upgrades, it's not fair to say that it's remained exactly static since 1979. It's got a 120 millimeter gun that packs a formidable punch. It's got also sophisticated day and night optics, which will give the crew of four a battlefield advantage. Vorchek, I'm going to pass this one uh, across to you. If you are the Ukrainian government and you're not used to using either Leopard 2 tanks or to using Challenger 2 tanks, are you going to look at this and say, well, thank you very much for this, but now I've got to take a section of my army out and go off and send them training for minimum 10 to 12 weeks and realistically a few months, really, six months perhaps? The Ukrainian government perspective is both here uh, focused on diplomacy, on maintaining uh, a growing solidarity across uh, across the Western act actors, but overall ac across the world, demonstrating that Ukraine is in this conflict not alone. And it's not reject, it's not going to reject or downplay any sort of assistance that especially comes so meaningful like tanks, regardless of their number. So that's uh, on, the, on the diplomatic side, on, on the relations side. But on the military side, just like my predecessor just me mentioned, Ukrainians have proven to be uh, very adaptable when it comes to uh, use of multiple systems, of, of different systems, uh, different platforms coming from various countries. And they've been adapting also NATO equipment to, uh, to the post-Soviet type of technology, uh, looking at some missiles fired from the MiG jets and, uh, and so on and so forth. 
So um, that, uh, that capability of the army, of the Ukrainian army, to adapt, to use, to actually train also on the equipment and then to put in the force um, in, uh, in a battle uh, group, uh, again, like described, and unlike Russians have been uh, using in the first uh, weeks and months of the, of the conflict, um, the, that, that shows that they are ready to, to take in the equipment and use it to, uh, to the best of its capabilities, I think. Klaus, I'm going to pass this one across you. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. You're, um, you're the president of Ukraine. You've received a large number of tanks. They're all sitting there outside your front door. Do you prefer the Challenger 2s? Do you prefer the Leopard 2s? Does it make a difference? Surely, if you end up with... Uh, for want of a better way of putting it, a completely mongrelized tank corps because you've got a large amount of German equipment, a large amount of US equipment, a large amount of British equipment, a large amount of French equipment, German equipment. You're going to have parts problems all over the place. So as the president, do you want Challenger 2s or do you want to have uh, Leopard 2s? Well, if I were Zelensky, I would go for Leopard 2 because it's a slightly more sophisticated tank than the Challenger. And above all, and most importantly, it is, of course, uh, widely available in the Western world. As you said, there are two to 3,000 tanks available. That's a large number. Generally, uh, generals say we need at least 100 tanks to make a difference so for the Ukrainians to push back the Russians from their territory. So with two to 3,000, there is a chance that 100 or even more tanks can be found in uh, Western countries and in countries who are prepared to deliver the Leopard 2 tanks if the German government gives its permission uh, to re-export them. It's uh, Above all, I think it's a political decision that the tanks will make, and of course the supporting equipment with the tanks, that the tanks will make a difference. I think no one really doubts. And Zelensky has been asking for tanks for many, many months. And he knows that his soldiers uh, need to be trained, but that is happening all the time. They are uh, trained right now in the United States on Patriot missiles. They are trained on, a, on an American military base in Germany on how to use uh, sophisticated military tactics and understand these. So that training has already taken place and has been taking place uh, uh, for the last uh, year, really, since the war started. So that is, of course, a difficulty, but it can be overcome. But the delivery of the tanks, of Western countries being prepared to deliver them, that is a crucial question. And here, clearly, the Leopard 2, because there are so many available, has an advantage. OK, uh, I'm going to cross this over to uh, Vorchek now. Now, obviously, what Klaus has said there is completely right. The Leopard 2, because there are so many of them available, and they're, of course, they're very heavily prevalent here in Europe as well, lots of parts, all of this is beginning to look like it makes sense. However, the Challenger 2 has been tested in battle. Even if on paper its specs are less good than the Leopard 2, it has been in combat, people know exactly how it performs. The same is true of the US Abrams tanks. We look at the Leopard 2 tank, the only times when it's been out in the field, arguably it was used with the wrong tactics, but it hasn't performed quite so well as people had expected. Would you still be pleased if you're the Ukrainian prime, uh, if you're the Ukrainian president? Well, naturally, so for the uh, for the very fact that that the volume and the numbers of these tanks available is uh, is so meaningful, but also because that would be that that would increase uh, the cooperation with the German government on the defense efforts, uh, the government that is critical for the for the future of European unity in supporting Ukraine. And this diplomatic side of things is uh, here no less important uh, than, than the mil military uh, theater, the, the capabilities, the technical, um, uh, you know, perks and, 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 and caveats of that. And uh, the very fact that German government is now getting into this discussion, um, there is there are moves within the German government with the dismissal and the, and the new minister of defense coming in around the same time. That shows that. The, the most important and potent country within the European Union that also is a bloc uh, that has just signed uh, an agreement with NATO that also coordinates on the delivery uh, of these uh, tanks to, to, to Ukraine um, is, 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 worth, uh, is worth all the, uh, all the, you know, uh, the, the downsides of potential downsides of, of, such, uh, of such tank. And okay. I don't believe there are such major, let's say. Yes, but the German government's had nine months of uh, this war taking place, 10 months of this war taking place in uh, Ukraine, or this conflict taking place in Ukraine. Yes, they, we, we could sit here and say Germany has been a stalwart ally of Ukraine all we like, 
10 months, they've still not made the decision. Meanwhile, you can have Challengers today. Hell, if you don't want to go with Challenger 2s, if you want to go with Challenger 1 tanks, the Jordanian government's just got rid of 400 of its Challenger 1 tanks. You've got all the parts, all the spare bits that you could ever want there. So, Peter, why, why go with Leopard 2s? Why not just say, we're not getting anywhere with the German government. Everybody, put your hands in your pockets. Let's go and buy 400 tanks off the Jordan Jordanian government. I think the key is um, the logistics behind it, as well as the training availability. So operating armoured uh, equipment on a battlefield requires a huge number of spares and probably requires, I mean, Zelensky's asked for 300 tanks. I think, he, you know, he, he's going to lose, and, and the Ukrainians know this, they're going to lose a fair amount of those tanks when they're in battle. A lot of them are going to go service, uh, unserviceable. And the older the platforms... Uh, the older age of them, uh, rather than the updated version, means the more prone they are to breakages. And this brings in a whole host of problems along with how you tow it, how you pull it, how you recover it from a battlefield, and then how you fix it. So what you need is 300 working tanks with a supply chain that is really quite geographically close to you, rather than some way away. Now, the Ukrainians have been very good at machining parts. They need to make stuff happen and fix. They've been uh, astounding at uh, adapting to multiple multiple pieces of military equipment they've been given to them. But what they need is one homogenous tank outfit, ideally, that allows them to operate a modern main battle tank right up at the front line. Now, this means that the Leopard is probably the best one suited for them and their geographic situation in terms of proximity to where the supply and logistics depot sit. So, Klaus, I've got to pass it over to you. Um... When we're looking at this and hearing from everyone, you like the Leopards, you think the Leopards are the right tanks for the Ukrainians. What is the holdup for the German government? Well, uh, one has to see that the entire Western alliance has been reluctant to send tanks. The Germans have been more reluctant than everyone else, but only now we are talking about providing a large number of tanks to Ukraine. You could say that the British and other countries also had nine or ten months' time to think about that and send their challengers. Why now and not five or six months ago? And of course, we notice that uh, there is an escalation in the conflict. The Western alliance is increasingly adamant to push Russia out. And one reason is because the Russians are, have embarked on very ruthless warfare, not just warfare against military targets in a more traditional sense, but against infrastructure and above all against civilians. This has hardened and embittered the Western alliance, as of course it has the Ukrainians. And it has and the consensus in the West that Russia cannot be allowed to win this war, cannot be allowed to get away with aggression and, uh, and proclaim victory despite having assaulted um, uh, uh, its neighbor in an, uh, uh, and the Ukrainians haven't provoked uh, militarily the Russians at all, uh, that uh, the Russians cannot be allowed to get away with that. That would have a devastating uh, impact on the global order. The Germans have a particular problem that they have had close relations with Russia really since the 1970s. Here the word Ostpolitik, Eastern policy, and uh, rapprochement through trade plays a role. And the whole dilemma of, or the whole complex situation of German unification, which could not have happened without uh, Soviet goodwill and Russian goodwill in the end, uh, comes into it. So the, uh, the, the, the SPD in the German government, the leading party, Scholz's party in the uh, German government, are quite reluctant to really take on the Russians too much. But that is generally uh, been overcome because of the ruthlessness of the Russian, uh, Russian warfare. And that is the reason why we are at the situation now and why the tanks were seriously considered to be delivered um, many months ago. But now I think the German government will fall in line. And the first step will be that they will give their permission to Poland and Finland and other countries to, de to deliver a Leopard 2 to Ukraine. And then the second stage will be that the Germans themselves will deliver Leopard 2 out of their own stock to Ukraine. Now, uh, Peter, if I can cross that over to you. Uh, Klaus has sort of hinted there uh, in his answer at the possibility of escalation through this move, which is certainly something the Russians have mentioned. They've said, look, you send more tanks into Ukraine, um, it'll increase the body count, it's going to escalate this war. Now, it would be very easy and flippant to reply to that, well, that's kind of the point and why we're sending the tanks, but what happens if this does lead to an escalation? Is there a risk of that? 
I certainly think there's a risk. I mean, this is a, this is the most difficult calculation that um, Western leaders have in sending military support to Ukraine, right? So when they talked about sending uh, HIMARS, the precision long range rocket system uh, to Ukraine, uh, when they sent Patriot, when they send additional uh, artillery capability, all of these decisions and announcements brought about a rhetoric from Moscow that looked like it potentially could escalate uh, the campaign and actions on their behalf. Now, they talked about nuclear weapons, but there are other options that they have taking this sort of uh, between conventional war and something more extreme that remain within the capabilities of Moscow. Western leaders are calculating that Moscow will not cross those thresholds, and for very good reasons. The research they've done makes them believe that uh, Moscow would not risk an all-out um, uh, uh, meeting engagement with NATO or provocation. And yet it relies on a really fundamental assumption that Moscow's leaders are acting in with a rationality and a logic as we perceive them, i.e. that they think and act like we do. Their minds work in the way that we do. Now, I'm not sure that Russian scholars would tell you this is necessarily true. And this is the eternal risk you play whenever you change the boundaries of what you're providing to Ukraine. Now, whether that's economic sanctions, diplomatic demarches, alliances, uh, or various other announcements, each of these moments increases the pressure on Russia. And we are predicting that they will not escalate the campaign, use chemical or biological weapons, for example, that they will keep this in the conventional realm. And yet, there remains a very real chance that Moscow will not act in a way that we perceive as rational or logical, but will do so in a way that suits their own culture and specifically their own political objectives. So, Vojtek, if you were a gambling man, um, what do you think Russia's reaction would be to a large number of tanks pitching up in Kyiv? Uh, first of all, I, I would not say and try to attribute uh, any sort of craziness to the acts of uh, Mr. Putin. This is uh, quite a logical mafia state with uh, clear interests of the oligarchy group at the top. And uh, while uh, how they behave and the boundaries they've been crossing are certainly uh, crossing the boundaries of uh, morality, but not of, of some psychological evaluation that would put them in a, in a different rationale. Then uh, we only then we can make our calculations and our, our decisions uh, more, you know, uh, uh, be, be, be better judged uh, against uh, this calculation that we that we make, and uh, for what we have seen in the past, uh, Russia has been escalating the conflict from day one, setting uh, after unsuccessful topping of the government of Mr. Zelensky, because the goal has been and and still is, I believe, on the Russian end to um, exchange the elites, change the government in, in Kiev and, and have a puppet government as, they, as it has been many times in history uh, to, be, you know, to be installed. Th that being unsuccess unsuccessful, uh, they've been escalating attacks and terrorizing the state, just as we have seen again from the countries like Syria, Chechnya and, uh, and others where Russia, uh, Russian army was operating to, to crush the resistance. Uh, the things we have not been doing in these countries was the providing providing uh, enough of military assistance for the for the those who who oppose uh, the brute force and terrorist actions. And should there be uh, one, probably we we would see uh, that uh, Russians are uh, calculating back and seeing that they are not able to um, and to win, they would not try to uh, cross the lines that that we consider. Um, as, as triggers uh, for, for uh, Western response on Russia directly. Klaus, let me cross this over to you. Um, we've been having a little bit of gentle back and forth about uh, British tanks versus German tanks versus US tanks. The fact of the matter is, where is France in all of this conversation? They're being very, very quiet. Uh, yes, to some extent, yes. So they have recently delivered more weapons and more uh, defense systems to Ukraine. So they are 
um, keeping a low profile, but they're not inactive, to put it that way. Whether the French tanks, and they have their own uh, tanks, whether they will be delivered to Ukraine, we don't know. So far, Macron hasn't really said anything about it, as far as I know. The French are setting themselves up as a mediator, to some extent, a pro-Western mediator, clearly, but still, they want to be able to push heads together and perhaps bring Zelensky and uh, put into the negotiating table. Other people, including uh, Turkish President Erdogan, also the Indian Prime Minister, are trying the same. Erdogan probably more active than anyone else. And Macron has the same ambition. But so far, that hasn't really led to anything, not least because both sides are not ready to compromise. The Ukrainians want to reconquer all of their territory, including Crimea, we should keep in mind, while the Russians do not want to give up any of the territory they are in possession of, Ukrainian territory they are in possession of. And that is not a basis for a good compromise uh, peace deal. Therefore, you know, any mediation efforts, including Macron's mediation efforts, are probably in vain right now. But Macron is certainly waiting in the in the sidelines to, to jump at the opportunity to bring the two sides together and perhaps uh, come across as a global statesman who uh, obtained peace. Klaus, Wojciech, Peter, thank you very much for joining me today. You're going to talk about uh, this topic. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and type in the Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, goodbye. Thank you for watching.